Hello and welcome to Zero to Hero, improving your container security strategy. Containers are certainly a hot topic these days and securing them brings special challenges. Today's webinar is sponsored by Synopsys and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Keith Ward and I'm delighted to be your moderator for this special event. Now, before we get to today's great content, there are some housekeeping items that you need to know. First off, we want this to be an informative event for you, so we encourage any questions in the questions box in your webinar control panel. Not only will we have team members responding to questions during the live event, but we'll also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the presentation where we'll discuss in greater detail some of the top questions that you ask. Now, that Q&A panel is also the place to let us know about any technical issues you might be experiencing. A browser refresh will fix most audio, video, and slide advancement issues, but if that doesn't work, let us know in the Q&A and we'll get right on it and provide further technical assistance. Next up, in the handout section of the control panel, you'll find a number of important resources, starting with a free PDF from Synopsys that you'll want to check out. You'll also find a link to the Gorilla Guide Book Club, where you can get access to Actual Tech Media's vast library of printed resources on technology topics. In addition, there's a link to the ATM Event Center, which has a calendar of our upcoming events. At the end of this webinar event, we'll also be awarding a $250 Amazon gift card to one lucky registrant. Of course, you've got to be in attendance during the entire event to qualify for the prize. And the official terms and conditions of today's prize drawing can be found in the handout section. Now, one of the best uh, benefits of this event and all actual tech events is the opportunity to ask a question of our presenters. To help encourage your questions, we have a special additional prize for you. Another Amazon gift card, this one for $50 for the best question. After the event is over, we'll look at all the questions that came in, pick out the very best one and contact that prize winner. And with that, let's get to today's fantastic content. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter today, David Bennis, Associate Principal Consultant with Synopsys. David, the floor is yours. Fantastic. Thank you, Keith, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Let's talk about containers, I suppose. So here's me. Like Keith introduced me, I'm David Bennis, as you can see right here in this slide, uh, Associate Principal Consultant within the Software Integrity Group at Synopsys, which is a bit too long of a title. Uh, suffice it to say, though, I lead the emerging technology domain, which includes containerization, blockchain, slash smart contract, and AI slash ML security. So I, I like to live on the cutting edge, essentially. What's relevant to this webinar, though, is that I've helped uh, relatively large number of our clients really improve their container security strategies within the organizations through just a, a whole bunch of different types of engagements and partnerships with them. Maybe what's a little unique, I suppose, about my experience is that I, I really learned from a hands-on perspective. I came up through red teaming container environments, working my way up to the architectures of those environments themselves, uh, just hacking them hands-on and eventually transitioning that experience to a policy and organizational approach perspective. And I honestly felt this put me in a, a very helpful, very valuable position for a lot of our clients. Um, by being the actual hacker that hands-on actually does the hacking of the containers and then being that threat modeler that looked at the architectures, their flaws and you know whatever else threat modelers do and talk to a lot of people about those issues, uh, and finally, you know, applying those approaches to understanding how an organization might best mature their container security posture. I think I got a very holistic view of container security overall. And the reason I'm telling you all that is because today I'd essentially like to give you the condensed version of all those years of experience, build you all up to a point where you can confidently understand you know, all those little bits that encompass container security maturity, or at least be armed to understand them in the future, uh, and the strategy that you're employing within your organizations. Uh, so first, we'll start with establishing common ground. You know, I, I think all of us can say that at some point you've attended a talk where they just assume you have 90% of the technical knowledge going forward. Uh, 
that's not what I'm going to do here. So I'll briefly talk about what a container is and, and what I'm actually talking about today. Uh, then I'll instruct you on you know, how people build with those containers, how Synopsys and my group secures the containers that have been built, um, how an attacker looks at those containers, how we as attackers break them in pen testing, red teaming exercises, and how you yourselves can learn to identify flaws in architectures of containerized solutions. Uh, this one comes with a small bonus case study, so uh, hopefully that's interesting to everyone here. And finally, uh, I will actually talk about container security maturity, how we've built a framework for measuring and understanding client program maturity, how to approach the next steps, and so on. Hopefully, uh, you can take away something from those items. So as promised, let's start with containers. What is a container? What do I even mean when we talk about containerization? So I always approach this with a little story of a few years back. I was at a gym, just having small talk with someone attending the same class I was there attending. Uh, it came up, you know, our jobs. I started telling him about container security and, and how that was a major part of my job back then. Uh, and so we had a nice chat, maybe 10 minutes later, heading to our cars. Uh, he said, you know, well, see you. And next time uh, I can't find lids for my containers in the cabinet, I'll think of you. And it was at that time that I realized he thought this whole time I had worked for a company like Reynolds and was securing their factories that produce like the plexiglass bulbs. But in reality, I suppose while that is very far off from what I actually do on a day to day, uh, it, it's not that far off for the sake of metaphors. Uh, and so the reason for these things that we're talking about today being called containers is because they were based off of the idea of a shipping container. What is a shipping container? You know, those big intermodal shipping containers that you see on the back of trains and on cargo ships and so on. Uh, these things were a huge boon to the shipping industry when a bunch of very smart engineers came together in, I think it was like the 20s or the early, 19, early 20th century. Uh, they wanted to solve a very common problem at the time. And that problem was, why should people that produce goods that they want to distribute across the world have to care about the box in which they come in? And so they came together and produced this standard shipping container. So no matter what you're shipping, whether it be fancy cars from Italy or coffee from South Africa, you can ship those in the exact same container. And as a producer of those items, you don't have to care about the middle step. You just ship it. And so few years back, a bunch of very smart engineers came together and wondered why, in fact, was it easier to ship coffee from one side of the world to the other than it was to ship software from a developer's laptop into a production environment a lot of times. Anyone that's worked in development knows that is a, or was, a massive, massive problem. And so since the intermodal container really spurred global trade, it was likely that the Docker engineers had similarly hefty goals of, of their product. Um, and so essentially, we've changed how organizations, they've changed how organizations are able to deploy and maintain software or even whole environments by allowing people to pack things into a container, a standardized solution. So when we talk about containers today, this is exactly what we're talking about. This method of packing, shipping, and deploying code in an expected manner. I won't stay on this slide for too long. I just like to make the point that essentially, the foundational elements of containers was Unix Truth, which was laid back in 1979. Um, what we consider, and I'm air quoting here, you just can't see it, uh, modern containerization was really developed in 2006 under the name Process Containers. Uh, this is essentially the foundational technology through which modern containerization and Docker rely upon. And hopefully, uh, surprising no one here, it really wasn't until 10 years after the fact that the domain of container security started to gain traction. People realized, hey, this really useful thing that we've been using for a while, we should probably start securing it. So now that we have our containers and that little brief bit of history behind them, what do we do with them? Well, owing really to the level of complexity and a lot of the stuff that surrounds the management of containerization, uh, a lot of containerization is implemented via orchestration. What do I mean by that? That is orchestration is essentially a way of 
automatically configuring, deploying, managing your containers. It really seeks to answer those really complicated questions like, how should I automatically configure, deploy, and manage the lifecycle of my containers? How should I network them? Uh, how am I downloading and deploying the images themselves that form the containers? Uh, so essentially, this is what we mean by orchestration, how the life cycle of containers is managed, deployed, networked, scaled, and so on and so forth. So chances are, in your organization, there are at least some orchestrated containers. Uh, usually, people are not just running containers themselves and not orchestrating containers, at least somewhere. Uh, and in your heads, you may be thinking of a couple of popular orchestrators. And you'd be right to do so because the most common one out there is Kubernetes, sometimes abbreviated K8S, because there's eight letters between the K and the S in Kubernetes. Uh, I won't go into detail here uh, because that isn't this kind of uh, this isn't that kind of talk. Uh, but you can see that everything is essentially predicated upon the container running inside that logical bit of segmentation called a pod. You can see in the lower right and upper right there in those boxes. So ultimately, Kubernetes, through that API server and all the little neat functions that it has implemented, is responsible for all things container lifecycle management. Now, I know some of you may be thinking that you do use Kubernetes, but this diagram is essentially meaningless because that entire left-hand side is the responsibility, perhaps, of a cloud provider. Uh, and that would be a really awesome thing to think because it perfectly segues into my next slide. So another way you'll see an orchestrator used is via this concept called orchestration as a service. Things like AKS from Microsoft, EKS from Amazon, GKE from Google, all those three letter acronyms are among the most common. And chances are, if your organization is doing anything in the cloud, then you probably have some kind of container service running today, even if it's not one of the three that I listed. Um, and as an aside, uh, if you truly thought on the previous slide that you know, all those elements were cloud MSP offloaded responsibilities, then you may want to give us a call. Uh, because really understanding the shared responsibility model, properly configuring your clusters in these environments, uh, in addition to the applications that you're actually deploying into them, are really significant security undertakings. And oftentimes, when we're either hacking or looking at the architecture or the, even the maturity of these containerized environments, this is where we find a lot of the issues. So from an organizational level, I suppose, these areas are often big blind spots, especially as it relates to things like logging, monitoring, IR forensics, uh, just overall security development expertise in general. Sometimes the container stuff, because it's so new, flies under the radar. Uh, and I've added this slide here because usually when giving talks like this, we'll get a question about uh, you know, the entire platform as a service. What if we are running containers as a piece of a platform as a service tool? Uh, honestly, uh, all, for a lot of our clients, this is becoming a little bit less common because open source and cloud technologies are a lot more approachable in how they manage these things. Um, but similar to orchestration as a service, you still have to be aware of the management responsibilities. Uh, where you leave more control to the product and the platform, you're still responsible for the proper consideration uh, security configuration, and these words almost rhyme, uh, of these things. Uh, so there's a lot of contextual elements that you'll need to look at when analyzing the security of applications uh, you deploy onto a platform as a service, especially in terms of what features you're toggling on or off. Uh, those light switches really, really matter in the long run. So we've touched on what? Containerization, orchestration, managed orchestration, container paths. Uh, here's just a picture, a, a really big picture that you'll have to zoom in on at some point if you want to see the details uh, to really drive home how much stuff is out there. And, and this right here is even somewhat of an outdated picture of the cloud native ecosystem. You can see, or maybe if you squint really, really well and put your face really close to your monitor, you can see uh, that containerization is a major, major piece of this picture. And organizations are often implementing at least some good chunk of this, especially as it relates to containerization. So it's really important to have a strong security overview of what you're actually using and, and how you are using those things. Speaking of strong security overviews, I, I did promise 
I would give you an insight into, you know, on that agenda slide, uh, how we at Synopsys actually do that. Um, so similar to you know, that preview I gave, securing your cloud and container ecosystem involves really understanding security through your SDLC. That is, and what I mean by this is applying security from the architecture phase all the way to the actual deployment of your applications. And so this is how we do it at Synopsys. This isn't really a sales pitch or anything. I'm just providing context on how we assess containers. We look at the risks of those containers and type of activities we do to verify the security of clusters. And really, it comes down to three main things. I'm holding up three fingers like you can see me, but you can't. Um, thing number one, determining if the container environment is architected securely. You know, if the threats against your assets are adequately defended against by the correct controls. Uh, that is what predicates architecture security. Are you designing against threats properly? Then, of course, it would be a really good idea to ensure that the configuration of what you've just architected reflects exactly that. Does the configuration reflect the design? That's super important. A lot of deltas happen there. You'd be surprised at what, or maybe not, would be lost in translation between those two things, those two steps. So you want to make sure that the right standards boxes are checked, the right configuration is actually applied relative to how it is architected. And finally, I'm sure everyone here would agree that it's very important to actually test the deployment to ensure that the architecture and configuration reflect the reality of the situation and are as robust as you hoped. Uh, and, and so those are the three boxes in this Venn diagram, boxes, circles in this Venn diagram here. ARA, that's just the way we call our architecture risk assessments, config review, and then a penetration test is kind of the icing on cake. Uh, of course, there are a lot of things you'll need to be aware of in the container security realm that aren't encompassed by simply these three circles. And we'll discuss some of these lighter, uh, lightly uh, later as well. Uh, and I know a lot of you that are listening right now might be thinking that, you know, sure, it's one thing to say, assess the risk of an architecture, um, but, Worry not, I'm gonna tell you exactly how we, at least from a high level, approach this solution. So essentially, we approach this problem through the lens of an attacker. And that is a common theme at Synopsys, is, is approaching things through the lens of an attacker. So I'll really try to give you some insight into the type of attacks we consider when analyzing such architectures. I'm not gonna read this list out. Screenshot it if you need to, or look at it in the handout. Um, but you'd be surprised that a lot of these elements are things that a lot of you, at least in the security professional realm, are probably familiar with already. Really, the, the only things on this list that are very, very specific to containers are like the container configuration best practices or secrets management, uh, container RBAC. Uh, so I always pay special attention to those elements because you know, a lot of times, companies don't have that inbuilt expertise already. And a bit more helpfully, we can break these down at least roughly into some certain scenarios to contextualize your architecture insights. Uh, and so helpfully, I like to associate these attack scenarios with, uh, air quotes, the right questions to ask. So you'll see I have four scenarios here. That malicious insider developer, I think is is something that, oh, my numbers are actually a little bit scrambled here relative to my notes. So scenario number one here, the malicious entity on the public network. I think this is a pretty common question that you're probably already asking, hopefully, uh, just applying it to containers. You know, are any of my Kubernetes service or endpoints inadvertently exposed to a public network? This is the external attacker kind of perspective that you can look at your containers with. Uh, scenario two, the, the whole adjacent network. Very similarly, if you have a Windows network already, this is a question that you're asking yourself. You know, can horizontal compromise lead to some level of further compromise? Can people pivot within my network? Very similarly, we like to ask this question of container environments, especially orchestrated ones. If you have a bunch of pods running, you know, can I access some adjacent Kubernetes cluster because of a shared secret or certificates or any of those interesting attack vectors? The malicious insider developer, 
this is a little bit more complicated, especially in a cloud or cloud managed orchestrated realm. Uh, ultimately, you want to understand if, for example, if a user has user level access to your Kubernetes API or cloud environment, or maybe even the ability to deploy containers that are a developer, uh, can you leverage that access to gain some level of privilege? Uh, and this is a very complicated question. There's a lot of moving parts when it comes to it, but it's important to at least ask the question, understand what controls are in place for the solution. And then scenario four there is always more complicated aspect because it's really, really specific to containerization, uh, broken down into various pieces that you can see there. But essentially, it amounts to asking questions like, can we escape from the container, compromise the host? Can we access or exploit adjacent applications and services? You know, Maybe you have credentials shared in etcd that allow access to other containers that you wouldn't necessarily have access to, so on and so forth. But Helpfully, here is a attack framework. If you're familiar with MITRE, here's something similar. It's the, the Microsoft Kubernetes attack framework. It's structured very similarly to the MITRE attack framework. And what I've done here is actually broken down uh, that attack matrix and associated each of the scenarios within it with those four scenarios. So essentially what I'm saying here is if you ask of your organization or of the application uh, those four questions, or you know, those four categories of questions, it's probably more than four questions. Um, the things in green or yellow here are things that would be covered. You have this covered just by asking those four categories of questions, which is a very large portion of you know, the possible attacks outlined by Microsoft at least, which I always think is, is a very cool way, very easy way of getting a baseline understanding of the architecture robustness of your containerized applications. So as promised, associated with this uh, little architecture overview will be a short case study. Here's a quick sample architecture, which I've put together. It's, it's loosely, very loosely based off of an actual client that we've worked with and issues that we found therein. Uh, so in this environment, there is a development infrastructure being used to create those container images containing you know, the primary application functions. Uh, call it a transactional banking application if you want. That's not what this was, by the way. Uh, but from left to right, uh, external container images being used in the creation of the actual Docker images were being pulled in through that security box. There were allow lists, image scanning, other security stuff going on in the box before those images were being ingested for internal use. Those images, <clears throat> excuse me, along with any images created via code being executed on dev workstations were pushed into GitLab pipelines, just a CI CD tool. The pipelines eventually spat out an image that was put into an internal container registry, which were then eventually pulled by some black box process and pushed into EC2, where they ran it on a Red Hat Enterprise Linux base image. Uh, and that rel base image was pulled from you know, the rel.com endpoint, put into the base image store, uh, and then had a bunch of work done on it via that golden image of fire to actually turn it into a golden image. Uh, those golden images were, of course, then pushed into the cloud, formed the base operating system for Docker containers. This is a familiar slide. So recall those four scenarios. And just as I walk you through how I would look at a scenario like this, think of in your mind how you'd apply these four scenarios to those things as well. So let's put our little you know, horned threat actor guy into the external internet trust zone. That kind of scenario one of a malicious entity on a public network is what this represents. And so a question to think to yourselves is what could this threat actor do? What would you be concerned about if your architect came to you with this? Um, some interesting questions that I would ask are things like, how do we know that the rel endpoint is actually sending us secure input? Secure images. Are we just trusting those 100%? Or are we doing some validation on those? You know, what happens if there is some level of real compromise? Obviously, that'd be bad for a lot of organizations, but is there something we can do to make us immune to that? Things like how do we properly validate those external images being used by developers? <clears throat> An interesting statistic is something like 
a little over 50% of all images inside of Docker Hub are vulnerable to something, something non-trivial, which is a crazy statistic to think about, especially if your organization is allowing your developers to pull down any images they want from the World Wide Web. Let's move the guy over. We're going to move him to the order, to the threat actor, uh, to the internal development infrastructure. And some questions that I would like to think about here. You know, are we ingesting those images properly? How do we know the containers we are actually producing are secure and validated through our security standards? What do we have in place here such that the security of what we're making is aligning with our security goals? What about configuration? Is the delivery process secure? Things of that level. You know, what can this internal actor actually do? And we'll hop one over to the AWS piece, which I'll just touch on lightly. You know, what could an attacker actually do here? Is this an internal threat actor? You know, what if one of our cloud ops people went rogue? Do we have adequate controls in place to prevent that from spreading into something bigger than what we'd actually want to deal with? What type of security tooling do we have to do we have running to ensure the integrity of the runtime itself? This is a big one nowadays. A lot of people are relying on software like Wiz or Orca to hopefully help solve this problem, but a lot of gaps in runtime security currently exist, especially when it comes to logging and analytics. In the traditional world, logging analytics is very easy. It is also or it's very easy to implement. Similarly with containers, it's, it's very easy to implement, but actually doing something with those logs is where the complexity comes in, and especially patching. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, and that reason being you know, lack of expertise oftentimes. Uh, when thinking about the rehydration or patching of images and maintaining them over time, uh, it also falls through the cracks. So just from that brief end to end, with these considerations, the security considerations on the left and you know, the four scenarios that we listed out previously, uh, look at how many potential issues we could identify just by using this as a structure. Uh, this was, again, based on a real engagement. A lot of those questions uh, that I just presented uh, ended up leading to risks being fixed before they became huge issues outside of the architecture. So, so far, we've touched on how attackers look at the container environments, how we can use that knowledge to look at the security of orchestrated applications from an architectural perspective. And I think that final piece of the puzzle that I'd like to introduce to you now is really how to look at your organization from a maturity perspective. No better time than the present. Let's get to the next slide. Uh, so this is actually a heavily abbreviated version of our uh, internal container security capability model. Uh, essentially, what I mean by that is that these are the areas that exist that can provide your organization with a holistic security suite as it relates to containers. Each of these elements certainly have multiple sub elements associated with them. That's kind of beyond the scope of a 40 minute talk today. Uh, but if you're interested, certainly reach out. I'd love to talk to you about these. But this should serve as a solid starting point as is if you're looking for some actionable areas today. A lot of times, organizations will only have that image security aspect in place. You'll notice that that image security thing is only one box on a significantly bigger diagram. And so if you're responsible for the security of your containerization, or at least are interested in understanding what areas you have in place, these are essentially the categories that I like to start with. But of note, just to bring the point home, that image security piece, if you are only scanning your images beforehand, you're not really doing container security. You're doing one out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight categories of container security. And since each of these do have sub elements associated with them, you may only be doing a fraction of the bigger fraction, which is something to be aware of. But of course, it doesn't just end there. When we perform maturity assessments for our clients, uh, we often have to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we often have to digest industry best practices in order for the policy that we're developing for organizations to actually have traceability back to existing standards. Uh, 
I'm flinging my fingers around here. You just can't see it. Traceability back to existing standards. Uh, whether those are industry best practices, like the ones that are depicted in this diagram, you know, NIST, CIS, CV, whatnot, or whether those are internal standards. So there's some level of happy medium work that needs to be done here. Enforcing traceability, we find, is a huge aspect, really, of establishing any sort of policy document or any sort of policy in general that doesn't get absolutely you know, shredded during the review process. And really, by shredded, I mean having the teeth of the security removed when usability versus security discussions are being made. I'm not saying that you know, that's a wrong discussion to have, because certainly that is a huge consideration of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. But we just want to maximize the security in place minimize the usability loss. And a really good way of doing that is associating those security elements with existing standards. Um, and so interestingly, that thing on there, the NIST 800-190 document, is a really good way of you know, fleshing out what a mature container security organization has in place. And so that's exactly what we do, actually. Uh, this is a just a snapshot reformat of something from our actual reports. Uh, and we use this to contextualize early state maturity within an organization. So these four categories, if you've actually read the NIST document as dense as it is, uh, you'll recognize as organizational aspects as they relate to container adoption. NIST has split them into four of these categories. Um, I, I usually, I usually what? I lost my sentence. But the four categories in this split up into the container security organizational aspects are these. Um, so the process and education of the developers, ops teams, and, and essentially just the whole teams that are responsible for deploying containerized applications. Uh, I, I usually find that that area, the initiation phase is what they call it, is, is really lacking. Since a good bit of time, clients, organizations in general are deploying containerized applications and then going back later to worry about the security processes that they have in place, which you know, the woes of exciting technologies, I suppose. This is not a very com like a unique problem to containers. We saw it a lot with cloud and we're seeing uh, you know, a set of that same problems apply to containers. And I think planning and design is, is fairly self-explanatory. Uh, and really what that means is uh, how involved is security in the architecture process? Do your architects design in a vacuum? And then are you building the security on top, hoping it all fix, fits together? Or is your security team really impacting that architecture process? Uh, you know, one of the core things at Synopsys is it, it's much cheaper to fix an issue, flaws in architecture, when the application doesn't exist yet. <laughs> Once you've actually deployed, architected, written the code for, that's a lot of layers to peel back in order to fix the underlying problem. But if you fix that problem early on, you, know, you have a significantly more mature security process. I won't really touch on implementation. I think that encompasses everything we've really talked about so far in this webinar. You know, a good place to look into this is your CISD pipelines, how they're set up, and really the organizational context behind the actual security and implementation of the security that we've just you know, previously talked about from the architecture phase to the pen testing phase, utilizing that attack framework and, and so on. And then finally, of course, and definitely no less important than the rest, is the operation and maintenance of containers. Uh, just like regular old servers, really, on your traditional Windows networks, containers should abide by similar lifecycle policies. And all too often, we see that containers get a pass. Uh, for the most part, simply because traditional enforcers of those decommissioning, patching, uh, and so on routines don't really have the visibility or the expertise to do this with containers. So how do we actually put all this together? I will give you a quick sneak peek. So here's how we, at least, when performing maturity assessments for clients, prioritize implementation of those organization elements organizational elements. Is that an adjective? It's a very simple method. Uh, we really have our own internal guidance on how we prioritize these things, which it's our IP, I can't share it and talk, unfortunately. But ultimately, it comes down to uh, prioritizing the things that give you the largest security posture improvement with the lowest implementation complexity. I understand that's a little hand wavy, 
but honestly, it's the best way for contextualizing wins, or at least showing that early quick wins exist and can be done, and then doing them is really important in a lot of orgs for really demonstrating to both upper management and even the teams that are implementing these things that container security works and has tangible benefit. And of course, this is just another screenshot from a very similar report. We can put it into a nice picture that actually plans and initiatives. It's just the roadmap version of that previous slide. So putting really everything that we've talked about together, you can essentially distill maturity of containers into the following elements. Uh, training your staff. This includes everyone developing anything that touches the container at some point. If all of those staff are knowers of container security, the most common pitfalls will not be common anymore. You know, they'll be a lot more difficult to fall into because awareness is really the number one defense when it comes to training. Why are there asterisks there? Those are intentional uh, because this really includes from the very start of the container lifecycle architecture. A lot of people, a lot of clients, a lot of organizations think that container security starts at the image level, which is far from the truth. If your applications don't consider the idea that they should have been architected from the start securely, I guarantee you, you have undiscovered flaws that are waiting to be exploited. Categorizing risk, also super important. You need to understand the risk level associated with your deployments, not just from a, this is a high risk application perspective. I think most mature organizations do that, but from a, I'm deploying into containers with you know, X, Y, Z context. It is cloud deployed. It is a multi-tenant application and so on. So I need to be careful about risks A, B, and C. Associating context with the risk is incredibly, incredibly important, especially with containers, because the difference in how you deploy these things can vary so greatly between them. Of course, you need to be aware of your security team and organizational capabilities. None of this works if you try to implement everything everywhere all at once. I think that's a movie, right? With a two-person team that knows nothing, obviously you have to be aware of what you are capable of doing. Another big point that we've come across is responsibilities. Clearly defining responsibilities for each element of the container security capability model that I showed you previously, or the container lifecycle in general is super important. Uh, in a legacy world, this is difficult to apply to containers and often really is a huge area of friction within orgs. Uh, defining responsibilities, essentially, make sure no one can offload responsibility to a team that doesn't expect it or doesn't want it. It's a very, very common thing where, you know, hey, scanning images is the responsibility of ops team. And then you ask ops team, ops team says, no, that's the responsibility of the security team. Security team says, no, that's the responsibility of the development team. Uh, in that world, you don't gain anything except confusion and friction. So that's certainly an area that we want to avoid. And finally, uh, what we just talked about you know, in the previous slides, establishing that traceability to existing organization and industry standards. Uh, using those elements as a backdrop for plotting your maturity roadmaps is really the piece of the puzzle that actually gives you a path forward. And of course, if you've done it properly, then uh, it should be a, a pretty clean, relatively clean journey forward. So I'm excited to see how it goes for the industry. And of course, if you have any questions that I can't cover here today, please reach out to provide a point of contacts. So I'll hear from them, get back to you as soon as I can. And really, that's all I got. Questions? Questions? Yeah. Um, hi, David. Can you hear me? I can, Keith. Oh, great right. to hear your voice again. Yeah, thanks for such a great presentation, David. Uh, really illuminating. Uh, the unfortunate reality, as you have pointed out, is that with the huge benefits of containers come new risks. You know, there's just no way around it. It's kind of like that in all areas of IT, isn't it? You know, any good stuff is going to come with some downsides as well. Um, so we've been having some great questions coming in from the attendees and i wanted to get through as many of them as we can so if you're ready let's just dive right in 
Um, first it. up, have you worked? Yeah, have you worked with clients that have their own in-house traceability they need to maintain? And if so, how does your model encompass those situations? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is actually a requirement that comes with most of the maturity work that we do with clients. Uh, basically, every client has some level of in-house standards that we need to work with and develop our roadmap in accordance with that list of standards. And honestly, it's a lot easier than if they didn't have such internal standards, I find at least. And the reason for that is because those teams are already used to looking at those standards when they're deploying their applications and architecting them and really using those as a backdrop for the work that we develop helps significantly. It really reduces the friction on implementation. Great question. Got you, got you. Okay, next up, um, how do you actually map the items onto onto the prioritization matrix? So, you know, what determines the quick wins or the ease of implementation for something like this, David? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's not a very scientific approach, to be honest. A lot of it leverages our internal experience in and essentially any of the context that we gain from the organization that we're working with. It's a combination of, of those two items. Uh, I wish I, I had an answer such like uh, such as you know, we have a big old chart and we, we feed it a bunch of calculated data, but really it comes down to what we know about the client, what we know about ourselves and putting those two things together. Mm. Okay. So here's one that I think probably a lot of the attendees have got right now because everybody's thinking about this. Uh, one of the questions, our organization is just starting to implement containerizations now. Um, what are the most important considerations at this point right at the beginning? What, what would you say to them? Yeah, I think the most important considerations from the very start is certainly if you look at that NIST document, uh, the initiation phase, those elements that are encompassed by that, education, training, and process creation. Before actually going out and developing code into containers, make sure that developers are educated, security teams are trained, and you're not going forward blindly. Having a plan is the best defense. For Especially with something as, as complicated as containers slash Kubernetes slash, you know, all of that stuff. Absolutely. Um, Okay, uh, next up, does the security strategy you've talked to also pertain to Docker alternatives like LXC for Linux, Hyper-V, and Podman? Yeah, absolutely. The only reason that I've backdropped this entire talk with Docker and Kubernetes is because they're the most common uh, ways of deploying containers and orchestration. Uh, the security strategies themselves Totally, totally technology agnostic. Good to hear. Um, okay, next up. Uh, this is something you mentioned earlier that scared me too, so I was glad to hear so see someone ask this. Is the proliferation of vulnerable images in Docker Hub due to folks just not paying for premium tier scanning? Yeah, so in part, I think there's a lot of issues with not scanning images before being brought into the organization. But really, it's just because anyone can upload anything to Docker Hub. And so all the libraries that are up there are essentially unvetted by any real scanning solution. So the proliferation of them, that's a good word, uh, isn't really because of the organizations that digest them, but rather the individuals that create them. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> we're still not as careful as we need to be, are we, on, on things like that? Okay. Um, got time for, for maybe one or two more questions. Next up, does Synopsys EDA tools run on containers? Yeah, I'm not part of the EDA team. That's an entirely different business unit. So I, I'm actually not the right person to ask that question. Um, okay. I, I have no insight into what the EDA design automation teams do. Uh, I'm sure you'd be happy to get the, to get the questioner in touch with the people who can answer that though. <laughs> I have no yeah, doubt. And th that reminds me that uh, we do for the attendees to make sure they download that synopsis handout uh, in the handout section, which will give you more information as well. 
Okay, um, I think that's about all the time we've got questions for today, but I do have one final thing uh, to ask you. Um, David, if someone wants to get started with Synopsys right away or find out more, what, ne what next steps should they take? Absolutely, reach out to us. Uh, you can reach out to me directly at my name, first.last at synopsis.com, and I'll put you in touch with the right person. All right, sounds good. David, um, it's been a pleasure uh, chatting with you now, um, doing some great Q&A and learning so much more than I knew before uh, about containers and Kubernetes and being safe in this, uh, in this new environment, in this brave new world that, that we're a part of. Um, thanks so much for all of your insights in the Q&A, and we absolutely appreciate your time so much today. Thank you, Keith. Okay, uh, now we are, have come to near the end of our event. Uh, we do have one more piece of business and it is the Amazon gift card prize drawing. That's the $250 Amazon gift card. And remember, as I mentioned before, you do have to have been present for the entire event to be eligible for the prize. So the winner of the $250 Amazon gift card today is Martin Bischoff from Mississippi. Congratulations, Martin, and we will be in touch soon to get you your card. So with that, on behalf of the entire Actual Tech Media team, I wanna thank David and Synopsis for making this event possible. And thanks to you, the attendees, as always, for attending, for being here today, and for all of your great questions. Love to see the engagement and uh, how much you're getting out of it. So um, with all of that, we are out of here. That concludes today's event. Uh, have a great rest of your day.